Okay, here I've just tried to keep track of uh, this, this particular page has been a little bit sketchy, but we're just keeping track of what has been covered. As I said, the first priority is to cover uh, all the material that you need to uh, get going with your project. Okay, and then there are some other concepts which uh, we will cover later. So we have, what we have covered, if anybody has a disagreement, please tell me. Underlying position or underlying exposure. Okay, every, that this concept has been covered. Then we also covered hedge position versus hedge transaction. A transaction is a purchase or sale of some base asset and terms asset. Okay, the, but the position is long or short. Is everyone clear? So if I ask you what is the hedge position, don't say purchase or don't say bought. Okay, so uh, hedge position versus hedge transaction. Then second is whether, I mean, the third is whether the underlying position is long or short. What is the logic for figuring that out? That we already covered twice yesterday in the in the previous class, and still some people were not on the second try. Also, some people were not clear about the logic. The logic is very simple, so you should go back and revise that. How to figure out? You obviously, you need some contextual uh, knowledge. If I ask you, what is uh, say Mexico's? What is Mexico's uh, underlying position with respect to crude oil? You know. <coughs> Okay, this requires some contextual knowledge. So essentially, you need to know whether Mexico is a oil importer, oil exporter. Okay, so Mexico is actually an exporter. Okay, so they're one of the big exporters, and Mexico, in fact, runs a very sophisticated sovereign oil risk, oil price risk hedging program. Okay, the most sophisticated sovereign uh, risk management program for oil. Okay, so Mexico is an exporter. So therefore, what is Mexico's underlying position with respect to crude oil? Long. Okay. So this is how you so you know the logic for figuring that out. Obviously, you need some contextual knowledge. You need to know which country the exporter, etc. So that is required. So given that, you can, should be able to figure it out. So this logic is important. Uh, how to justify your answer when I ask you whether Saudi Arabia's underlying position with respect to crude oil is what? Saudi Arabia's position is no. long. Okay. So then, obviously, the way, how do you justify that answer? Then you have to say that if oil prices go up they will benefit if they go if it goes down they will lose so only a long position behaves like this okay so that's how you justify it okay so then uh, the underlying positions for magma for the balance sheet we looked at the balance sheet and oh, one minute i don't think uh, yeah it is recording <coughs> Okay, so back to the balance sheet. The other thing that we have also covered is this is something very important for your project. You need to be aware of this. What are your underlying positions with respect to each of the key risk factors? Okay, so we will discuss the key risk factors when you uh, when we answer the questions in the case. But at least you know what are the underlying positions for magma because this is what will determine how you are going to hedge, uh, run run the hedge book. Okay, so this is another topic that we have covered. Then. Okay, so we've covered the underlying positions for MACMA, including the position with respect to three month US dollar LIBOR, okay, which is short because if rates go up, they will suffer. Okay, then the other important concept which we have covered, which is uh, critical for your risk management, is that you have to understand that the hedge position is an offset to the underlying position. Okay, so the theory of hedging is that you set up a hedge position which will act as an offset to the underlying position. Okay, that's the idea of hedging. Is everyone clear about all these concepts? We have covered all this. You make sure you understand all this. Okay, so now we have to cover the rest of it just to make sure that you are able to um, uh, manage the balance sheet what will happen is let's let's look at one more concept um, okay so this is uh, why am I showing you a, a why am I showing you a picture of Changi Airport uh, a map of Changi Airport you see that this is uh, I didn't want to waste time drawing uh, those three-dimensional type diagrams so the idea here the concept that we are trying to cover here is that 
the hedge position and the underlying position are managed separately. So here you can see level one and level two of Changi Airport. Okay. Now what we have is let's imagine that the level one is the underlying position. Okay. And the level two is the hedge position. So the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that these two books, once you run a hedging program, they are run as parallel programs. Okay, parallel positions or parallel books. Okay. So you don't uh, you don't disturb the hedge position does not disturb the underlying position. The underlying position remains the same. You are just running uh, like a shadow position, okay? Shadowing the underlying position, you're running a parallel position or a parallel book. Okay, is this point clear to everybody? That the hedge position or the hedge book runs underlying, uh, ha runs parallel to, okay, uh, the uh, underlying book, uh, position, okay, or the underlying book. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, this is the idea that we want. Well, this is also important that when you're managing the risk uh, for this particular, when you're managing the, the treasury and the risk for this particular company. Uh, you will have this image in your mind that you have the underlying position which is not going to be touched. You are not touching the underlying position. You are separately managing an offset book. Okay, so it's standing on a, on a uh, it sort of sits on a different plane. Okay, so that is the idea here, and that's another concept, which is that we have to write down that. Actually, on this we can use a wider zoom, maybe. So the projector area is bigger. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, This is the other thing that you need to be aware of. Now let's look at so this brief. I'll just change some of the things, and I think you'll get about uh, you will get about maybe at, um, okay. So a little. Um, I just want to cover the material, so it's a little haphazard. Obviously, the material that we are covering is a little haphazard uh, because I just want to make sure that you get all the project-related immediately uh, the information required for starting the project that is conveyed. Okay. Okay. So let's cover this part first. Let me run through uh, so that you have an understanding of what actually is going to happen. All right, so we have this, uh, there's too much light actually. Uh, can you shut down, uh, guys, just try to shut down the lights in front. That's what we normally do. Yeah, I think this is okay now. Yeah. All right, so uh, what you have to do is obviously, so uh, you understand that uh, because you have all these positions, okay, you have all these positions on the book, you've already seen how if market prices change, your balance sheet value will change and your net worth will change. Okay, so a drop in net worth is associated with a profit or loss? A drop in net worth? Loss. loss. Okay, and a rise in net worth is associated with a profit. Okay, so now that's what you, so you're aware that you have these key risk factors that the balance sheet is exposed to, the underlying position. Okay, and therefore you have to, you are aware of all these underlying positions. And so the problem is that if you just sit and do nothing, if you do no hedging, Okay, and at the end of the project, whatever period that you're looking at, in your case, we will try to make it four to five weeks at least. Okay, the prices might move. Okay, and what will happen is that uh, so this the way this is going to work is that we are just going to start the project on a particular day. Let's say we are starting on 30th September. Okay, and then you will also notice that so, so everyone is clear about that concept that because you have a balance sheet where there are underlying positions. Which are exposed to certain key risk factors, okay, like the dollar yen exchange rate and the copper price, etc. That your balance sheet is exposed to risk, okay. So therefore, uh, it may go against you or it may go in your favor. Either way, okay. So what will happen is you notice there are two sheets in your uh, in that spreadsheet in the in this workbook. So I should call it a workbook, okay. So on this online workbook, if you see at the end, you can't see the the lower part, the guys at the back. 
but there are two sheets when you open this this is a starting balance sheet okay the starting balance sheet is on 30th September we assume the project started on that day and what is the balance sheet at the okay so here you notice that the starting reference network was 48 for 49 million okay which is coming from the from this figure on 30th September because of these prices on 30th September your net worth was 48.9 okay so we'll call it 49 so there's a second sheet which is the ending balance sheet figure okay I think we have to make this smaller so that everything is visible okay I think we can see everything okay so now understand how the project is going to work. I've already told you two things. That one is that the hedge book function is sits on top of the underlying book. Okay, you don't touch the underlying positions, but the hedge book is run as a kind of a shadow or an offset. Okay, in parallel to the underlying positions. So what will happen is that we also have a, sh a balance sheet ending sheet uh, for the balance sheet. Now you see this is 10th of November. So your project is going to end on 10th of November. The last trading day for the project is 10th of November. So what has happened is that just now obviously one doesn't know, no one knows what the prices will be on the 10th of November. So I have just made some assumptions. Okay, Let's assume that uh, the gold price drops to 1000, copper, price, uh, copper prices are at 2.4, uh, West Texas prices are 52.3. Okay, I have deliberately done this to show a loss. Okay, Because we don't know what is actually going to happen in the future on 10th of November. Okay? But I've just made some assumptions to show that there is a loss. Okay, I've changed the prices. You notice all the prices are different. Have you noticed that? Okay, so this is the ending balance sheet. So we have a starting reference. So over there on the top, you can see on the second row, the starting reference net worth of 49 million is, is placed there, okay, for reference. Now this is the balance sheet on 10th. That was on 30th September. And this is the balance sheet projected on 10th of November. Okay, so what will happen is you'll see that in this on this balance sheet now the net worth net worth has come down to 31 is that clear everyone follows the net worth has come down to 31 okay so now uh, obviously there is a now you see that there is this uh, uh, cell number uh, which is c15 is it c15 yeah c15 you will see a loss of 18.1 that's 18 okay what is that what is that 18 how did i get the 18 Oh, sorry, yes, oil. How did I get the 18? Yeah, but 18 is what? Which cell? What is the formula in 18? What is the formula in 18? The asset value of the opening balance sheet minus my asset value of the closing balance sheet. Not asset value, but net worth. Net worth. Net worth. So that figure is that 18 figure is coming from so if you see if I take the cursor to that figure what is the formula there is C C13 minus H2 what is C13 C13 is the closing net worth 30.8 okay so the C13 is the closing net worth and H2 is the Starting reference network. Okay, so that 18 loss which is being shown is the difference in the two networks. Okay, the network has fallen, so you are showing a loss of that much. Okay, all right. So is this point clear to everybody? Okay. So if you we are just having this first discussion now, the first level discussion is we are assuming that you are very lazy and you are not going to do any hedging. Okay. So if you don't do any hedging, then if this this is what actually happens we, we don't know what will actually happen but if this is what happens on 10th of november these are the prices on 10th of november then you will show a loss of 80 million is this clear everyone okay your balance sheet will show a loss your underlying positions are showing a loss of 18 million on 10th of november okay so now what you have to do is now i've made an assumption so now what will happen is you are going to use this software we are still assuming that we are going to use it in Oanda, not uh, TWS. But in either case, the logic remains the same. Whether you use Oanda or TWS, the only difference is, if in TWS you will be trading futures, and in Oanda you are trading using CFDs. Okay. So, uh, but it, otherwise the the conceptual processes remain the same. 
and on Rwanda you will not be able to manage the three month US dollar LIBOR risk. That, that facility is not there here on, on this particular software. Okay, so what you're going to do is, let's take, um, let's take oil as an example, okay. It's too big, okay, let me just, so I go to tools, I don't want to view the spreads. Uh, no, I need to do that from here. So, what is this thing? No selection. Yeah, I'm going to just, I want to reduce, I don't want to see the spread so that I can actually have a slightly bigger display. Yeah, I want the chart to occupy a little bit more. Uh, so. so if I look at this, uh, to take an 8-hour chart view. All right, so now, okay, guys, now, suppose I look at this now, what you're going to have to do is, so the first thing is understood that if you don't do anything, if you don't do anything and the rates move against you, then your underlying position will show a big loss, okay? So we need to, therefore, that's why you have the need to manage the risk, okay, on a corporate balance sheet. That's why you have to manage the risk because you could end up, this is just an 18 million loss, you could have a much bigger loss, okay? So that's why you need to manage the balance sheet and that's what you're going to do. So if you feel, for instance, so this is what you're going to do, you're going to actively manage the risk and you're going to look at it, I'm going to give you the example with respect to oil, but the logic will be the same for every other commodity every other uh, key risk factor. The logic will be the same. That's why we had to uh, cover earlier the concept of, I mean, to understand what are your underlying positions in each of the key risk factors, okay? That's why we have to understand that because that logic is, that knowledge is important. You need to be aware. So in oil, what is your underlying position? In oil, you're long, okay? So you're long, so that means you're worried. So what you're gonna do is look at it this way. So, yeah. Uh, as you said, uh, in Wanda, we will not be able to uh, manage the risk of uh, three months ago. Yeah. So, what is our alternative for that? So, in this case, in this case, I will not penalize you for whatever is happening on three month LIBOR. Okay. So, we will not consider that. But you need to be aware theoretically that that risk exists on this software, since we don't have a way of trading that instrument. TWS. If we do the project on TWS, you can manage it there. But uh, so we are not going to do that if we do it on Wanda. So that will not be fair. that will not contribute to your loss. So essentially, the underlying position on, on with respect to three month LIBOR, if three month LIBOR rises dramatically in the period in which you are trading, uh, that would ordinarily affect your underlying position value as well. But we are not going to factor that in in your evaluation. Okay. All right. Okay. So remember, now we are going by each key risk factor by, by each key risk factor one by one we're going to take each of them one by one <coughs> so let's take oil so my position is long so again now you have to form a view that's why you see remember in your earlier project in the nsc trading project in the equity trading project what were you doing you're taking views because you're running a speculative book Okay, you're running a speculative book. You have to take your take, take a view on the market whether you want to buy or sell. You decide what your view is, and then you buy or decide to buy or sell. Okay, so that's why if you notice now, even in the hedging, even in the hedging scenario, you still have to take a view on the market. That's why in your entire teaching of the finance selectives, there's such a heavy focus on financial markets and on taking views on on asset prices because everything you do in finance. Okay, is going to require you to take a view on markets. Every decision is based on a view. So you have to get used to taking views and this is why you see even in risk management, okay? So what is going to happen? Now I'm going to look at this chart, okay? And we can make it a little bit. Okay, so if you see here, then I could take two views. Okay, let's start one by, let's take them one by one. Suppose I look at the crude oil chart and my view is bullish. You know, there's a lot of talk in the market now that crude oil is going to 100. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, you've seen that. Okay, good that you're aware of this talk. Okay, yes, 
Now people are saying it will go to 100 because in November, early November, the Iranian sanctions are kicking in. Okay, so that will take some oil off the market. And the fear is that Saudi and uh, Russian exports increasing uh, the Saudi output and the Russian output is not going to be able to compensate for the loss of Iranian oil. Okay? And Venezuela is also in a very dicey situation because their production has all kinds of problems. So if your view is that oil is going to 100, okay? So as a corporate hedger, what are you going to do? As a corporate hedger, what are you going to do? I, if your view is that oil is going to 100, okay? And your underlying position, you know what your underlying position is, okay? So if now we're talking about actual decision problems, okay? Because you have to do this every day, maybe several times a day. You have to take the decision whether I should hedge or remember what I saw, what I showed you. That if you don't hedge and prices fall dramatically, you are going to have a big loss on your underlying position, okay? So therefore, you have to just take a decision on whether you want to hedge or not. At least you should be prepared to hedge. Okay. So now you look at the oil price, and your view is that oil is going to hundred dollars. Okay, and there's very limited downside. So in this case, what, what in this case, what is your action or what is your decision as a hedger? What will you do? Okay. So Sahil says you'll leave it as it is. Shana is saying you go long. Sir, if the if the prices are increasing, so we go long. Okay. You go long. Shana is saying you will go long. Anybody else who wants to give an opinion? Sahil is saying that we will leave it as it is, we will not do anything. Tushar is saying that we will go long. Anybody else? There is also saying you will go long. We are talking about, now you are looking at the situation as a hedger. You are the treasurer of magma resources, you have, you have this balance sheet to deal with. Now you need to take decisions on what to do, whether you should hedge or not to hedge. So you are saying that you will do something. Will you go? No, I am only asking about the decision of buying and selling. Remember, remember we had the decision problem of whether to buy or to sell. Yes, sir. Okay. Now we are talking about that decision. Okay, whether to buy or to sell. Okay. So what are you going to do? He is saying I will not do anything. And Tushar is saying I will buy. Bear is also saying I will buy. If my view is long, I will go buy. Okay. I mean, this question is based on the. Information I've given you that your view is that oil is very bullish and it's going to hundred dollars. Based on that view, now what is your decision? He's saying I will buy, and Sahil is saying I will not. Uh, I will not do anything. And what is Bell is also saying I will buy. What is your decision, Dipakshu? Buy. Okay. Sorry. If you are a hedger, then will you? Now you are not an investor. You are a hedger. You are in the hedges. So forget about the instrument, forget forward contract or futures contract is different. Whether you will now given that your view is bullish, that oil is going to hundred dollars, okay, and your underlying position is long, okay, you will buy. Okay. Alright, okay guys, now let's get you will go short. But why will you go short? If your view is if your view is that oil is going to hundred and I've given you a uh, detailed view that your view is that oil there is very limited downside. And oil is going to hundred dollars. You are very bullish on oil. So if you are very bullish, why would you go short? Sorry? Okay, I understand your position. I understand what your logic is. So he's saying that he will go long and he will go short because his underlying position is long. Okay? And to minimize your risk, you want to go short. Okay. So, I understand there is some logic to that, but okay, let's clear up the logic here now, what has to be done. First is, that's what I am saying, the market is bullish. Yeah, okay. So, not market is bullish, your view is bullish. Okay. So, this is where, okay guys, now you have to understand a few things. First is that, as I, as I said, why is the whole teaching of finance being centered on financial markets? Because every decision you take in a finance setting, okay, is going to require you to take a view on markets. Okay. So the second point which follows from that is to contradict what uh, Goyal is saying, okay? That is that even your hedging decisions are going to be based on your view, okay? So therefore even your hedging decisions are going to be based on your view or you could take an extreme view that I will immediately hedge everything 100% like the situation that Tanoj was referring to the other day. That's a view but that's a very passive approach to hedging and most people don't do that, okay? Most people don't, it's not a wrong thing to do, it's also a legitimate problem. So if you do it that way, the way that Thomas was suggesting, or uh, the question that he was raising, that if you hedge 100% right, right at the outset, okay, 
then you have no more risk. As I said, you can go on holiday. Okay, you can do that. That's a legitimate approach as well. But then that does not require uh, you to take a view on the markets. Okay, and that's normally not done by most treasury. Most people take a little bit of a view on the market. So the first thing, therefore, from that, what follows is since hedging is also based on a view. What Boyer is saying, this will not happen because if your view is bullish, you are not going to sell, you are not going to hedge. Okay? So if your view is bullish, you are definitely not going to go short and you are not going to hedge. You are only hedge when your view is bearish. Okay? So then now we have to choose between Sahel's view, which is do nothing if your view is bullish, and then Dushar's view, which is do go long. Okay? So here comes the second rule of hedging. Okay, the second rule of hedging, which is the hedging situation will be governed by a different set of rules from what you were doing in your NSE project, in your stock trading project. Because there you could go long or short, okay, unlimited amounts as long as you have account equity to back it up. Okay. Here there are some restrictions. Okay. So this brings us to the first restriction. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there any other benefit from retention if the person if, if a person is doing hundred percent again? What are the other benefits that a person? Is there any benefit? The benefit is the only benefit is that uh, you have immediately locked in everything, so there is no more uncertainty. You have removed all uncertainty yeah, with respect to your uh, value of your inventory is affecting your uh, total uh, PNL. Okay, you removed all uncertainty, and so what you can say is that then the finance team can focus on other activities. That hedging business does not require the hedging activity does not require any more time. Sir, but uh, if the risk is reduced. Then the money, profit and loss also will be less from that side. Yeah, so you can't make profit either. either. You can't make a loss or you can't make a profit. It will be a neutral situation. What's the answer? Sorry? Then it will be a neutral situation. Yeah, you have locked in everything. Remember we showed you that if you had a if you had a, uh, if you were bu budgeting your uh, jet fuel purchases, yes, we, we looked at that situation yeah. where your airline is budgeting jet fuel purchases for the next year and they have budgeted $85 a barrel, let's say. Okay? Jet fuel is not sold in barrels, but we'll assume that it is, okay? To maintain parity with crude oil. So if you are assuming that uh, then 85, okay? And then if you lock in the uh, crude oil at 80, then you have gone short the spread at 5. Okay, so you still have a position. That's not a good example for your exam because there you still have a spread position. Okay, but assuming that let's say you are able to hedge, uh, let's say you are able to hedge the uh, jet fuel itself directly. Okay, at 80, if you are able to hedge the jet fuel at 80, then you have locked in a five dollar margin in terms of your five in terms of your budget uh, performance where it related to budget because your budgeted cost is 85 dollars. And you have already contracted to buy everything at 80, so you have saved five dollars on the uh, with reference to your budget. Okay, all right. Okay, so guys, now focus on the next rule because we have to decide who is right, whether Tushar is right or Tushar and Bell are right, and Devangshu on the one side saying that if your view is bullish, okay, even though your underlying position is long, you should go long, and on the other hand, we have Sahil saying that you should do nothing. Okay, so Sahil is correct actually. So the rule of hedging is, let's come to this rule. So remember that these are, so as I showed you, two different positions. Hedge position and underlying position are two different books, okay? And when your final profitability is assessed, you look at your net PNL here. Let me take this up a little bit so that everyone can see. Okay, what is the net PNL? Minus, no, net PNL is in uh, G G25 or something. Okay, uh, so the net PNL is minus 11. How did that minus 11 come about? Can you guess? Yeah, so minus 18 plus 6.7, or yeah, say take it as 7. Okay, so minus 18 plus 7. The hedge PNL is showing a profit. The hedging book is showing a profit of 6.7 million. Okay, the underlying position is losing 18 million, but the hedging position, the hedge book is showing a profit of 6.7 million. That means whatever transactions you did on the hedge book, okay, which is like what you're going to do on your OANDA, your OANDA account will be managed, will be basically like your hedge book. Okay, so whatever transactions of buy, sell, etc., you did on your hedge book, that is showing a profit of 6.7. And that's why your net PNL is eleven dollars minus only eleven million, okay, not minus eighteen million. Okay, so the 
the way that hedging works is, and this is the same in any hedging scenario, okay? The way that hedging would work is, you always have to look at your total position, okay? You have to always look at your total position, which is your hedge position plus the underlying position. Okay? Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, because your PNL also at the end of the day will be taken as the uh, sum of the two. Okay? So you always have to monitor the uh, two books separately and your net position, you have to keep an eye on your net position. And that is the sum of the underlying PNL, underlying positions, yes, uh, uh, underlying positions on the balance sheet plus whatever positions you have put on on the hedge book. Okay? So the rule that we are coming to to answer to, to show why Sahel is correct is that Okay, guys, this is a very important rule in hedging, which is why Sahil is correct. Okay? Understand this rule, which applies in every hedging situation. Okay? Read the rule here. The part that is in bold, under constraints. First, read it properly. Everyone read it properly. The initial underlying position is what you saw on the balance sheet. Okay? Hedge account position, let me do something on the hedge account. Let me now assume that my view is bearish, so I'm just going to sell. Okay? I We discussed the bullish view, but let me just assume that my view is bullish, uh, bearish, and then I'm going to sell, let's say, um, Okay, so if you see my position now, I have a short of 100, uh, in this case, this is basically just in terms of barrels, okay, uh, just in terms of um, units, okay, it's not like 100 barrels, this is just, uh, sorry, this is actually 100 barrels, it's not 100 uh, into 100, con it's not 100 futures contracts, it's just 100 barrels. Let me try and uh, let's look at the size of the position here, what is the size of the oil position, it's 1 million barrels, right? So let me try and also sell um, Okay, so now what is my hedge position? Thousand, uh, thousand uh, barrels of uh, crude oil, okay? So what we are going to look at now is my So what is the look? Let's go back to the rules. So I have sold a thousand barrels and my underlying position is uh, yeah, so now look at the constraint once again. The initial underlying position was 1 million barrels. Okay? Then the second is the hedge account position. My What is my hedge account position? Minus 1000. Okay, so the initial underlying position is 1 million and uh, the hedge position is minus, uh, is minus 1000. Okay? So my net and so basically the net uh, the net of if you see the uh, constraint the way it is written the net of the un initial underlying position adjusted by the hedge position hedge position in this case is minus 1000 okay at any point of time has to remain between zero and the initial underlying position is everyone clear about the logic i mean this is the rule you'll understand why this is because this is a hedging situation it's not a speculative book it's a hedging book so that you uh, so you have to manage it according to the principles of the classical principles of hedging okay if you do it if you don't follow this rule that means you're actually adding speculation to the to a hedging book which is not the correct way to do it yes but i'm not getting the point okay what you understand what is the what is the rule given here no, sir. Okay, what is the what is the part what is confusing about it? So you are saying there are a few Monday, Monday. There, are, there are a few elements to this rule. There are a few elements to this rule. The first element is initial underlying position. Okay, let's test it in the case of crude oil. The initial underlying position is one million barrels. Is this is clear? Okay, so what is the rule saying? 
this is essentially what I'm saying is I'm showing you why Sahil is correct and uh, this is one of the central rules of hedging. Okay, why you can't actually buy, if your view is bullish, you can't buy additional amounts. Okay, but let's understand the rule first. There are a few elements to the rule. Initial underlying position, everyone understands. You can see it on the balance sheet. Okay, yeah, 1 million barrels. Then um, the hedge account position, also you understand. I have just sold a thousand uh, barrels on the hedge account. I just sold a thousand barrels. I'm just coming to that. You can't do that. Well, but understand the hedge account, hedge account position is clear to everyone. I sold a thousand barrels on the hedge account. Is everyone clear about that? And the response is not very strong. Too many people are talking. Is everyone clear? I sold a thousand barrels on the hedge account. In the Uanda hedge account, I sold a thousand barrels. Okay. So that hedge account position is thousand barrels minus thousand barrels. So that is what is being referred to by the head, that expression number two, hedge account position. At any point of time, you can see your hedge account position with respect to each commodity. Okay. With respect to each uh, key risk factor, you can see your position. Okay. So what we are saying is that in hedging between the two, the net of the two. So the initial underlying position is 1 million barrels minus uh, uh, 1,000 which you have sold on the hedge account is minus 1,000. So 1 million minus 1,000. Okay. And that what we are saying is that 1 million minus 1,000 initial underlying position minus hedge account position or adjusted for the hedge account position. Okay. Uh, should remain the net of the two has to remain between zero and the initial underlying position which is 1 million barrels. Clear? Because remember what is the objective of hedging? What is the difference between a hedger and a speculator? Yeah, so the hedger is reducing his risk and the speculator is increasing his risk. Okay, it's trying to increase risk. So to remain true to the profile of a hedger, the hedge PNL has to, uh, the hedge book should only on a net basis it should reduce the hedge it should reduce your risk it should not increase your risk okay so what Tushar was saying and the others were saying that cannot be done if your even if your view is bullish you cannot increase so this is a central rule of hedging if you want to run it in a classical hedging program unfortunately many even many large companies they actually don't follow this kind of rule because but that's not correct that's why they end up having all kinds of disasters risk management disasters okay so you have to make sure that your hedging policy is such that your hedging, your hedging activity is actually reducing your risk. So now do you understand the rule? Whatever is your one second, let's understand the rule first. We'll come to the question. But there's no multiple account. Even how, how you can't have a multiple account. You have only one hedging account. You can have multiple accounts and you have to aggregate all that. If you have multiple accounts, you have to act for hedging. You have to aggregate all those and have that as a net hedge book. Okay, so here we are talking about only one hedge account, but even if you have multiple, you would have to aggregate those into one and then apply this rule. Okay, so the net of all your hedge positions in a particular market, okay, underlying position plus plus minus hedge position, okay, should not exceed the initial underlying position and should not fall below zero also. Are you following? One minute. I don't know why. Okay. Okay, let's understand this guys, one sec. Your underlying position in crude oil is 1 million barrels. Okay, now you're a hedger. So you cannot, and then you have the hedge position also on the separate, uh, another, on another side. You have the hedge position also, you can see on the hedge book, your crude oil position is minus 1000 barrels. Okay, this situation is okay because your net, remember all the time you have to look at your net position. Your net position is still long, but it's uh, between zero and one million. Yes. What does the rule say? The rule is saying whatever your initial underlying position is, okay, your net position should remain. Net position means hedge position plus underlying position. The sum of the two, okay, with the appropriate signs. The sum of the two, the net position should remain between zero and the underlying initial position. underlying position. Is it clear now to everybody? Yes. Anybody has a problem understanding this? All you guys at the front, Rahul, Imani, okay, I'll explain it once again. 
So this is a rule of hedging. This rule comes from the fact that hedgers will be looking to reduce their risk. Okay? Speculators will increase their risk, but hedgers should be looking to reduce their risk. Okay? So therefore, this rule has to be followed in the if imagine if you did what Prashar was saying, let's say, if your view is bullish and you buy another 1,000 barrels, okay? So now your net position is 1.1 million? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, not 1.1 million. Uh, uh, yeah, 1.01. 1, 1 million plus 1,000, okay? Uh, so that, that is your net position now, okay? But that has already exceeded your initial underlying position. Okay, so what have you done now? You have actually increased your risk. You had an initial underlying, initial position of 1,000, 1 million barrels. Now you have increased it by another 1,000 barrels. Okay. So this is actually like a speculator. You are acting like a speculator. Okay. So you cannot increase your position from the initial underlying position. Okay. At the same time, once you are fully hedged. Okay. If you are fully hedged. Okay. Let's assume that your uh, underlying position is 1 million barrels, and your hedge position is also 1 million barrels. Okay. You are 100% hedged. Uh, I mean, hedge position is short 1 million barrels. The underlying position is long 1 million barrels, and the hedge position is short 1 million barrels. Okay? So your net position is what? Zero. zero. Net position is zero. Okay? Now assume that my view on the oil price is very bearish. My view on the oil price is still very bearish. Should I sell? No, sir. No, sir. I should not sell because then again I'll violate that rule which says that the net position has to remain between zero and the other line. Because even if I sell, what will happen? My net position will go to short oil. Okay. I have no business weighing net short oil because I'm an oil producer. I can either be a long certain amount of inventory or that inventory can be fully hedged in which case my net position is zero. But my net position should not fall net short because I'm not a speculator. Is this clear? So that's why, because if you imagine, if you remember the idea of the hedge account, the hedger has to keep on reducing his risk. Okay. In between, if you have sold 1,000 barrels, you can buy back 500 barrels. That's okay. You can even buy back 900 barrels. That is also okay. Initially, if you sell, let's say your underlying position 1 million barrels long, then initially you go short 1,000 barrels. Okay. After that, you can buy back even 999 barrels. And even a thousand barrels you can buy back. That's okay still. Because your net position still remains between zero and one million. It has not exceeded the uh, initial underlying position. Yeah, it has not exceeded the initial underlying position. Okay, so all those fine tune all that fine tuning you can do. After you have sold, then if you think that it, it will bounce again, then you can sell again. So there is no time. And then you can buy back and yeah. Is there any component of time in this at or you can do it regularly or no no, this has to be met, this condition has to be met at all times. This condition must be met at all times. Whatever your hedging horizon, typically in a corporation, in a, in a company, when you're hedging for a company, typically you'll be hedging with uh, one year in view. Okay, sometimes you can hedge even longer, three years, five years. But whatever it is, you will have to specify that earlier as part of your hedging program. Okay, but whatever the period is, this condition should apply at all times. At any point of time, when someone looks at your uh, books, they should see that the net of the hedge position and the underlying position does not exceed the initial underlying position and does not fall below zero. Is this clear to everybody? Now you understand the logic? Are you able to connect it logically to the idea of hedgers versus speculators? Because the hedgers have to reduce their risk and if you go outside the limits of that zero and initial underlying position, you will violate that rule. You will be increasing your risk. Is this clear? Okay, so when you hedge, so this is one very important rule to keep in mind. When you are running your hedge account, okay, in this project, you need to make sure that this rule is always being followed. This rule is always being followed. That this condition is always being okay. So that's why if we go back to the decision. So the logic, the way it works is like this. Okay. The way it works is like this. So when we see, go back to the initial condition, initial discussion. I said that my view is very bullish. Okay. I'm going to close this position now. Then So now I have no position. So my underlying position is long 1 million barrels. Now I look at the oil price and I am very bullish. And my view that is, is going to 100 and it's not going down much. So in this case as Sahil said, the decision is, correct decision is to do nothing. Okay. 
So this is how you are going to manage the book. And you are going to have to do it for each of the key risk factors. So you are going to look at each market. Okay? You are going to look at each market and take a view on the market. And if your view is that it's very bullish, okay, then you will do nothing. If the underlying position is long, where I'm talking about a situation where the underlying position is long, okay? So we're taking the case of oil. When the underlying position is long, I look at the market, I form the view, and you can do this every, ideally you should do it every day, and multiple times a day also if required, because your time horizon is quite short, okay? So you take the view, every time you repeat this process, you look at the market, you take a view, if your view is very bullish and the underlying position is long, then you do nothing. Okay? If your view is bearish and the underlying position is long and your view is bearish, then you hedge. Okay? How much you want to hedge, that's up to you. It depends on what you are projecting. In terms of, if you think it's going to collapse, immediately the price is going to collapse, then you hedge a big amount. You hedge maybe 90%, 85%, whatever you want to hedge. If you want to give yourself a little more room and a little more flexibility, then you may hedge whatever, 25, 35, all that is you. That is where the decision, that's where the judgment comes in. Okay, there's no fixed formula. It all depends on this is where you have to use your judgment. Okay, so you have to figure out where, where you want to, uh, how much you want to hedge. So if your view is bearish, underlying position is long, then you will hedge. And then obviously you have to make sure that you do not break that rule. So if your underlying position is long, 1 million barrels, you can't go short 1.2 million barrels. Okay. You can only go short to a maximum of 1 million barrels. This is clear to everyone? This is the logic. Now we have already covered your underlying positions. Earlier what you know what the underlying positions are. Okay. So now you know what you have to do with each uh, situation. So this is a very important rule that you have to follow. And then what will happen? Yes, sorry. The function you have some questions. So if you are importing crude oil, what is your underlying position? No, no, importing from oil. You are giving the example of a businessman who is a businessman who is importing crude oil. So if your business is importing crude oil, then what is your underlying position with respect to crude oil? Short, short, right? So then what is what is your question? In this case, you will flip it around the logic. If your underlying position is short crude oil and your view is that market is very bearish, it's going to collapse now. The market is the crude oil market is now, it's around 74 uh, and it's going to collapse now. It will fall immediately to 65 or something. If that's your view. I'm just taking an extreme example. In this case, what will you do with your situation of being short crude oil underlying position? What will you do? Yeah. So that is correct. So that you will do, obviously you will do nothing, right? Because your underlying position is short, he is giving an example where your underlying position is short and your view is very bearish, you think the market is going to fall, so therefore you will obviously do nothing, okay? Because you can't afford to go short again. Yes. So then it will increase your net short position and you will break that rule. Is this clear? So this is how the hedging logic works. So you have to take a view on the market and do it on a regular basis, okay? And then as you do this, as you can see here, there must be some PNL in what I did, okay? What happened if you see the activity? I did something, see, I closed the two trades. Let's see how the hedge PNL gets built up, okay? One minute. Okay, so you see this now, what I did just now? See how the hedge PNL is going to get built up, okay? That I sold in two in two lots. I sold a thousand barrels, so I have lost. Uh, uh, I don't need this. See what happened, how the hedge PNL is generated. I sold it at 73.93.7 and then even the closing price is the same. Okay, so when I sold these, I, I opened these positions at 73, uh, one is 95.7, one is 93.7 and then I have sold them at, the, at these prices. Okay, 
so this has led to a profit one in one case the profit is zero okay and in one case the profit is 2.2.83 dollars okay because we've done it imme immediately and there's a financing charge because these are actually uh, cmds so everyone will be equally affected by these charges so uh, that's not that's not going to worry us as such okay so these are financing charges related to the type of instrument you're trading so in this case you can see your hpnl is showing a profit of about 2.83 dollars uh, but 2.73 actually because that point one will have to be by uh, 2.72 times okay so is this clear to everyone are you clear about what we have done because we just uh, sold initially and then we bought it back I just bought it back because I wanted to close the position and show a zero position on the hedge book. Okay, but this is what will generate your PNL. Okay, these are your you will be buying and selling because what will happen is if you if you in this case let's go back to the balance sheet your underlying position is long. Okay, so initially if you have a bearish view you will sell, but if you feel that uh, let's look at this how you might fine tune the hedging program. Okay, so let's say if you feel that. Um, Okay, so you can see here. So there is a long. Can you see there is a little bit of a neutralization of the trend from here? There is a long uptrend from here. Can you see that there is a little bit of a neutralization when it breaks below this high? Yes. Can you see that? A sequence of lower highs, higher high. Oh, I'm sorry, not lows. Higher lows. Can you see a sequence of higher lows on this chart? Okay, but towards the end you see that one of the highest lows from which the new high was made that is actually broken on the downside. Can you see that? So you could say that this trend is neutralized. Okay, so initially you might go short and let's say when the price goes to about 70 or so, you might feel that then there's a chance of a price jumping again to 75, okay, before it falls again. So let's say if you have sold a thousand barrels at this price, okay, 74 or something and then the price goes to 70 and then you feel at that point the price might jump again so you might want to buy back your thousand barrels are you following what i'm saying so this is all important to how you're going to do the project okay you have to actively manage your hedge book that will get you into the habit of taking views on markets are you following what i'm saying what no response all half dead. This is the second period, and you're already half dead. Responses. So, are you following what I said just now? Okay, good. So, uh, so first you take a view on the market. If you feel it's bearish, your underlying position is long. You go short. Let's say you go short. Let's say 25% of your position. You go short at 74. Then the price drops to 70. Then you feel that now there's a chance of price jumping to 75 again before it drops. So then what you might do is you might cover that thousand barrels short position okay and wait to sell it at a higher price so there you'll make a profit by selling at 74 and buying back at 70 for thousand barrels so that profit will get added to your hpnl okay in this way your hpnl will keep getting built up then when it goes to 75 again this time you might sell uh, you know three million barrels or four million barrels whatever uh, not three million three three thousand four thousand okay because your total position itself is one million okay are you following what is what has to be done in this way you have to manage the situation to ensure that you are you have to try and maximize your total pnl because remember that you can't do anything about the underlying position pnl you can't touch the underlying position that will remain as it is the only thing you can do is you can be aware of the underlying positions and then if you feel that underlying position is long and that market is going to drop drastically drop in price then you have to sell it through the hedge book okay so you're managing it as an offset remember yeah. is this clear to everyone yeah. you can't touch the underlying position so the objective is always what is guiding your decision making okay, why are you selling because you are trying to what is the logic driving your decision making why are you selling when the market is bearish on an underlying position when the underlying position is long sorry <laughs> what is the logic? Uh, what is the logic for selling? Based on what we have already told you. 
possible because of the US BRS and we are we have already a long position to so next that press will uh, sell and go to between zero and underlying position. Yeah, but what is the other thing that we said about the how will your how will your total performance be evaluated? Is it just by looking at the underlying position? Plus <laughs> So the the main logic why we are driving why are you selling because you, you think that your view, your view is bearish, okay? So you think the market is going to drop? So what I was getting at is the see the underlying logic also so that in case you forget you can always work everything back because we said what did we say that your objective is always to. Uh, maximize the value of the net position. Net position is defined as underlying position plus hedge position. Okay, so if you feel that the market is going to drop in a case where the underlying position is long, obviously your underlying position will lose value. This is clear. Your underlying position in oil is long, and your view is that the oil market is very bearish, the prices are going to drop. Okay, therefore, what is going to happen to your underlying position? It's going to drop in value, it will show a loss. So what you're trying to do by going short in the hedge book, by creating a short position in the hedge book, why do you create a short position? Because when prices drop, a short position will make profits. Okay, so the logic is that you are trying by going short, you're trying to uh, maximize the net position PNL. Okay, so the underlying will show a loss, you can't do anything about that. You're setting up an offset so that then offset in such a way that the offset will show a profit when the market. You see how everything is logical? Are you following that everything is logical? Is this clear? Yeah. Sir, so whenever we enter in the hedge transaction, so if the market is in the if we are long in underlying position and market is bearish and we enter a hedge transaction, then our net PL will always be zero if we are hundred percent hedge. If you are 100% hedge, it will be zero. So, there are only two, two chances in hedge position. Okay, there is one more condition. And your view also has to be right. Yes, sir. Our view has to be right. But once you do that, I mean, your net position has to be basically, the net position will be zero. The net gain and the change in the net gain will be zero. Because whatever happens on the underlying book will be offset. Fully offset. So that means whenever we enter in a hedge transaction, our net gain will either be zero or negative. We can never, we can never have profits. You can have profits because what did we show you here? That's why, see, so your head. Is that here no, I didn't say the constraint is 100% hedge. No, no, you don't need to have that constraint. That's a very uh, limiting constraint. Before, if you have a 100% hedge uh, policy, then you don't need to spend much time on a hedging program. You don't need to devote resources, as I said, in response to Tanuja's question, that there are certain advantages to doing that. If your treasury is has very few people and you are focused on raising capital and doing other jobs and you don't want to spend money on, uh, you don't want to spend resources on because hedge, active risk management requires some time, uh, people have to be devoted to the task, you need to set up equipment and all that. If you don't want to do any of that, you can decide to hedge 100% as soon as the exposure arises. That's a legitimate hedging policy. But many people don't do that because they feel that they can actively manage the position and make some profit. Because understand that your HPNL profits, HPNL profits are actually unlimited, almost unlimited. Because you can do this. See, suppose let's take an example. Okay? Let's assume that we are trading. We are always going 100% hedged and 100% unhedged. Let's take that example. Okay. So what I do is let's say my view is that that oil prices will drop to 70. So I sell a million barrels here then prices drop to 70 then my view is that it will rise if I take this view if I take a 8 hour chart okay those I have to uh, Satyam and Ishan just write down the names Gaba right same group but still okay you can I'll remember the names too much talking going on okay so I have to start deducting marks okay now suppose I, I sold it initially at 74 I sold a million barrels 100% hedged I go 100% hedged at 74. Then the price drops to 70. Now my view is that the price will rise to 75 before it drops again. Okay. 
so then what i do is i buy back my full 1 million barrel hedge position i buy it back at 70 yes. so on on 7 on 1 million barrels i have made 4 dollars yes sir okay so now it goes to 75 again i sell it at 75 okay i sell it i i sell the full full position at uh, 75 so 100% hedged at 75 yes. this time the price drops to 65 mm -hmm. then i feel that the price will rise to 70 72 maybe so I buy back my entire 1 million barrel short position on the hedge book. I buy it back at 65. So I sold at 75, I made it at 65. So I made $10 now. Yes, so total I have $14 net profit on 1 million barrels. Yes, and this way I can keep on doing it. Okay, so if you are able to call. So the point is that if you are able to call the twists and turns in the market, because remember market doesn't go up straight. Even if you see here on this chart, the market is going up on a net basis, but it's not going up in a straight line. There are ups and downs. Okay, so you see all these higher highs, higher lows, etc. Okay, so if you can take all, if you can catch all these twists and turns, okay, which is of course very difficult, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that it can't be done. Okay, uh, so therefore, if you can catch all these, theoretically, you can make almost unlimited profits on your HPL. That's why you guys have to be because remember all your grading is on a relative basis. Okay, so whichever team makes the highest net PNL will be will be give, will be given hundred percent of the score for this for, for this weightage, which is thirty percent. Okay, so you will make hundred percent on your score will be hundred percent. So your net net PNL can be higher if you have a high hedge PNL. Underlying position PNL you can't do anything about because you can't touch those underlying positions. And as the market prices move, it will keep on moving. But you can do something about it by playing around with the hedge position as an offset. Is this clear to everyone? Are you following the logic? Okay. So you have to maintain this uh, rule that your net position has to remain between zero and the initial uh, underlying position. I I U E. Okay. I U P. I U P. Okay. Initial underlying position. Okay. So this is basically the logic. Let's look at any other. Uh, Rule situations that we have. So there, Nagpal will also just write down Nagpal as well. I don't know who he's talking to. I uh, obviously he's talking to Ayush. <laughs> he's picked up the mantle from Ayush. So write down Nagpal and Ayush. It's the same group. So poor Akanksha is losing. Her group is losing lot of marks. You should maybe you should put a tape on Ayush's mouth at the beginning of the class. Ayush and uh, uh, Nagpal, so that they can't talk. Okay, all right. So, guys, what are we, what are we doing now? Let's look at the. Let's look at some other important constraints which you need. I think from this now you will get a good idea of what to do. Okay, let me just. I will share this brief with you later on. One minute. Okay, okay, guys. Now, so let's be hundred percent clear about what's going to happen at the end of the project. Then we are going to look at the net PNL. So you have to make your submission on this project. I will update the prices, and uh, you, you will just submit your uh, PNL figures to me. Okay. So the 6.7, the blue cell is the entry data entry. So underlying position PNL I will calculate. It's the same for everybody, and you will submit your hedge position PNL along with your account uh, passwords and all those things, so I can verify the uh, figures okay, by looking at your account. Okay, so that's what will happen. Then I look at the net PNL for each team, and whichever team has the highest net PNL will get 100%. And then the last team, last ranked team, whatever their score is going to be, that I will decide. Okay, it could be 25, 45, 35, whatever it is. That percentage I will determine, and then between the people will get on a prorated basis. Okay, so all your trading projects are graded. Okay, so is everyone clear now? We have a very good idea as to what has to be done. We have a clear idea as to what has to be done. Okay. I'm still, I'm still in the mode of quickly showing you everything that you need to do your project, so that you can now start practicing. The idea is, the reason I was going in this haphazard manner, covering only those topics you that absolutely need in order to start doing your project, okay, is because I can, uh, so that I can get you guys started on your practice, okay. Um, 
So now you know what is going to happen, how it's going to be evaluated. All that is clear. Yeah, so the goal, I have already told you the goal. I will share this sheet into your folder so that you can read this for reference. Okay, but I've already told you what your goal is and that's why you go short when your view is bearish and the UP is long. Okay. And now we have to do this in TWS or OANDA? That I will tell you. For the moment you practice on OANDA. Because OANDA is, every team has an OANDA login. Yes, is that correct to assume? Is that a safe assumption? Yes, okay, all right. Okay, all this stuff is writ going to be written down in your in your project brief. But all you need to do in the class, I think you've already understood what I've told you in the class. Okay, uh, that logic you understand that it's written down if you want to. Uh, okay, so this everybody understands that this logic, the hedging logic, please make sure you understand it. We have already discussed it. If your UP is long and your view is bullish, then you don't do anything. Keep watching. Keep watching until your view becomes bearish and then you hedge. Okay? Is this clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. All that is written here. Everything is written down here so that you will not have any problem. You don't have to take notes or anything. Um, you've written their names? Okay. Although all this stuff is being given to you, uh, still people are talking in the class. I don't require you to take notes, everything is being shared with you, video is being given. In spite of that, instead of focusing in the class, people are talking still. Many people are talking. Okay, so this constraint has, always been, has also been covered. And so the hedging, unhedging part here, yeah, what is said? Hedge, unhedge. You saw already what I meant by hedge, unhedge. I gave you that example where you go short initially, then the price market price drops, and then you feel that there may be another jump in the price. So you cover your short position, and then again you go short at a higher price. Okay, that's what you want to do. Okay, so this is what is meant by hedging, unhedging. You can keep on repeating it many times. Okay. Okay, so all these are the formalities for the sub account. Make sure you create, uh, this should not be FPR, this will be, I, I'll share this with you, okay? I'll share this with you, uh, with. Okay, so I've given you account starting funds of. And in a way it'll be good if you do it on this project. So this is because this is not the account in this. Is, and remember one thing, guys, don't trade in your account. The project account that you create according to the brief, which I've told you, okay? Yeah, create account, change account. Here, this is my account, okay? Uh, so this is my primary account with 97. Here, this one I put in 100 million, but I think I've told you guys to put 150 million, okay? When you create the account when you create the sub account. So here there is no trading. Yeah. In your account it was coming that when you do 100 times you can do the bid. Yeah. And our it is coming to the only. We are not getting the option of Drop down menu does not include 100 options. No, sir. Maybe because that depends on the jurisdiction from which you have registered. If you are registered from Bangladesh, let's say. Canada. Canada. So the Canadian authorities, okay, this is coming to the rule of uh, so this is a good question actually. Some of you remember Gary was asking this kind of a question sometime back in the class. The regulation of OTC markets. Okay. This is an OTC market. Alright. So like Namaj has registered his account from Canada. Okay. So in this case, Namaj, you make sure that you uh, increase your account number to so that at 100 is to 1, you have 150 million. So you accordingly double your, you make it 300 million. If you are only being allowed 50 is to 1 leverage. Yes. Okay. So this is an example of how OTC markets are regulated. So he has registered from Canada and he is not getting the option of 100 is to 1 leverage, which means the Canadian authorities must have given permission to enter to market to Canadian clients on the condition that you cannot allow leverage of more than 50 is to 1. Are you following this logic? This is how people re regulate OTC markets. 
the jurisdiction in which you operate, the regulator there will place some constraints. Depending on country to country. Country to country. Like the Reserve Bank of India does not allow you to trade foreign exchange, margin foreign exchange. That's why you can't open wider accounts from India. This is clear. This is how actually uh, ODC markets are regulated. Okay. So what does it say here? Anything more? Okay, so you have to declare the account name and I will in remind you once again to read all this. So this stuff will change. Okay, this will change. Report submission details. Okay, so I'll give you some charts and all that. All this has already been covered, okay? So I'll give you the charts for all this. Okay, so now let's just quickly go back to the let's So now I think I've pretty much covered everything that you need uh, to start practicing for your project. Okay, you already have the balance sheet, so you will start forming views on the market and getting ready to start your project. I'll give you the starting dates later, but let's quickly go through this and now we'll go to the rest of the note. Okay, so remember now we come back to the technical note. Okay, remember this case, this actually, this case is huge because we can run the entire course on this case. We have so many things to cover. Okay, there are two more technical notes. So now what we are going to do is we are going to go through in sequence the actual technical notes since the project related information has already been explained. Now we will go through in sequence and cover the rest of the concepts involved. Okay. So so outright versus spread positions everyone has understood. We have covered a lot of those also. We have covered the different, the low volatility of spread positions. Okay. We have covered that important concept. That's an important learning, understanding what is an outright position and what is a spread position and how they behave different, differently. Okay. And why people prefer to take on spread positions like an airline, which will have exposure in jet fuel, but they may choose to hedge through crude oil futures because they're much more liquid. Okay. But they will have a spread position, but that is still much better than having an outright position of short jet fuel. Because the spread position will has will have much less risk. The spread position has much less risk okay, than an outright position. Okay, so that's that's an important uh, concept to be aware of. Okay. So here there's a lot of discussion on this atomic level markets. You can read this and see if you have understood it. If you don't understand, then you ask me a question. So if I've given you the notes and you haven't asked a question, I assume that you have understood everything, okay? Because the things have already been explained in the class. If you don't understand something, you should you're supposed supposed to ask questions. Intermarket spread. Inter this has also been covered, okay? Players in financial markets. We don't. It's already been covered. Risk. Okay. Now let's go through this. Okay. Typically, this is how risk management. Remember. Okay, guys. One more thing for your interviews. As you start preparing for your interviews. You should start now. We have covered many concepts in finance. Okay, we have covered, and you should start looking at clusters or families of concepts like order types and decision problems. That's a topic. Okay, because you're going to get two types of questions in your interviews. You will get either you will get like a out of the blue question where they will decide to ask you like who is Ramram Rajan, okay, something like that. Okay, so that you can't prepare for really as such specifically because you don't know what's coming. Okay. But then if you fail that question or even otherwise, they may ask you, they may give you a second chance and say that, okay, if you don't know who Raghuram Rajan, right, tell me what have you studied? So that's where you have an advantage. That's where you're actually being given a penalty kick because you are being allowed, given a chance to show your knowledge on topics you have studied. So there you should give your topics. Remember, I've already told you, don't give white topics like stock markets. Okay, give narrow topics. Like you say, we've covered order types and decision problems. We have covered some important order types. So if you are able to talk with expertise on order types and decision problems, connecting it to decision problems, okay, then it will be very impressive. Okay. But make sure you understand the topic. So when you prepare, you make sure you understand, understand identify the topics. 
So this is like a topic cluster, order types. All the different order types, what situations they are used in, okay? All these things. So make sure you master the topic, okay? And, and then you can say, I can, we, I, we studied order types because we had to do these projects. Then risk management becomes an entire topic by itself. So you can talk about this case and whatever you studied in corporate treasury risk management, what kind of project you did, the rules of hedging, why the net position cannot go outside zero and the initial underlying position, all these kinds of aspects. So bring out all these things, okay? So this in a risk management interview or any other situation, if they ask you what have you studied, you can talk about this. So this is also part of risk management. What are the, this is like a taxonomy of risk, okay? Remember we have a taxonomy of asset classes, markets. Yeah, taxonomy is a science of classification and also a particular classification. A particular classification is also referred to as a taxonomy. Okay, right. So this is a taxonomy of risk. So typically we look at market risk, okay, credit risk, financing risk. Okay, somewhere you might find a different classification, but this is uh, what I prefer. Then you have operational risk. You have operational risk because like there's a story of one uh, one German trader who was trading on the Do Deutsche Thurman Bourse at that time. So he put his elbow on the keyboard and he wasn't aware that he was actually transmitting continuous sell orders. So, you know, millions of sell orders went into the system and the market actually sort of crashed. This happened because the guy was just sitting with his elbow on the keyboard. Okay, so this is all, these are all examples of operational risk. Sometimes you might tell your back office to remit $35 billion. They may uh, transmit $350 billion. Okay, so these kind of errors can happen. These are all operational risks, okay? Legal and regulatory risk, here you can see all these cases. Like right now you have US sanctions. You have US sanctions against uh, Iran, okay? Coming up very soon. So all those companies, that's why all these European companies are running away from uh, Iran. Because if they get sanctioned, they won't be able to do business in the US. So that's a big market, so they don't. nobody wants to do that. Like Renault, I was looking at an interview of Renault, the chief CEO of Renault. They have already substantially wound down their activities. Renault is a company that makes Nissan. Renault Nissan is a company, okay? So a uh, joint venture kind of thing. So uh, these guys have significantly wound down and uh, so these are actually like legal and regulatory risk, okay? So if you have these sanctions, so if you if you fall foul of the sanctions regime, that's an example of the materialization of uh, regulatory risk, okay? Or legal risks, okay? So. Um, so when you study the different types of risks, mainly we are interested in, in finance, we are mainly interested in market risk and credit risk. Okay? And what you are what you are managing, uh, this is what you have to be aware of as well. What you are going to be managing in this project is going to be purely market risk. You're not really concerned with this is basically what is meant by market risk. Okay, yes, time. Okay, all right. Okay, guys, all right, let's go. So you're done. Time is up. Sir, in point nine, which instrument we are trading? Like we are trading futures in DWS. Yeah, this is the CFD. The instrument that you are using in one That's why you have this. That's why you have this. If you see on my account. Which instrument you told earlier? Like in DWS, we have future contracts. In, uh, point now we have a CFD. This is called a CFD. These are called contracts for difference. You see, CFD, CFD, Cal Canada, France, Denmark. Contract for difference. These are con you can read about them on the Wanda website. You can read about them on the Wanda website. So they are a particular type of financial instrument. Yes, it's a type of financial instrument, just like futures contracts, swaps, uh, swaps or forwards. Okay. I've not listed CFDs because CFDs are actually a retail instrument. So here we are mainly looking at institutional trading. So I've not listed CFD in, in our classification. When we have an asset classes markets instrument, I've not listed CFD because I've only looked at uh, wholesale instruments like uh, institutional market instruments. CFDs are a retail instrument. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll have to check that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, Gaba. 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 Sir.